Today, our guest is Josh, Josh Cox from uh, Burker and Beam, and they have actually been a presenter here at One Million Cups before. Um, so this is a little bit of a recaffeination. He's going to come up. He's going to tell us a little backstory about him where he's been, how he got to where he is today, and then maybe the things that he's working on that's different from when he first came to us, um, and goals and, and things that he's looking towards for the future. So let's give him six minutes and then be prepared to ask awesome questions because this is all about engagement and building relationships. Work. Okay. Which button goes, goes left. Okay. There you go. So it's a pretty standard clicker, I guess. <laughs> How are you guys? Uh, my name is Josh Cox. I'm owner of Bricker and Beam here in town. We're a custom furniture shop. We specialize, like I say, in handcrafted modern statement pieces. So anything from a conference table to a dining table, <coughs> coffee table, desk, anything that looks like a table generally. Or um, we'll also do some credentials as well. Um, but uh, I guess I'll start with one of the things that people ask me first. They always say, Bricker and Beam, where does that name come from? There's got to be some sort of a story behind it. And in fact, there is. As a kid, see, I don't know if you can see this as well with the lighting, but um, as a kid, we would, I would spend my summers up in Ohio at my grandfather's farm. So 20, you know, 30 acres of woods, farmland, tractors, chainsaws, BB guns, basically a little boy's dream. And so going up, spending time with my grandfather was always really important to me. And this picture here is what we affectionately call Bricker Hill. It's a pretty boring, normal hill, but it was the last hill that we hit before we get to, got to my grandfather's house. And so whenever we got to this, this hill, I was just starting to get pumped, like so excited. In fact, even as a grown man, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Um, but kind of, I wanted to instill a nod to my grandfather, a nod to that passion, that pure joy into the business. And so that's where Bricker and Beam comes from as we you know, got to Bricker Hill and the excitement and so on. Um, this is my grandfather's workshop. This is where I learned woodworking as a kid. My grandfather's a woodworker. My great grandfather, his father was a woodworker as well. Um, really go, uh, going up and, you know, it's not an industrial shop. There's nothing crazy. He didn't do the type of stuff that we do, but really just sparking that passion, sparking that understanding of, oh, I can cut down a tree, turn it into boards, and then turn it into furniture. It just sort of blew my mind as a kid. <laughs> the second question people always ask me is, well, wh you know, when did you start this? How long have you been making furniture? And the truth is that I've always made things to some degree or the other, whether it's this wooden iPad case uh, that I made for my wife a while ago, or a cutting board, or just miscellaneous odds and ends. Um, but I've always made things to some degree. Uh, the first piece of furniture I ever made was for my wife and I. This was literally the first table that I ever made in my entire life. Don't judge too harshly. Um, but at, at the time when we first got married, we had all hand-me-down furniture, as you can see by this wonderful uh, fluorescent, or not fluorescent, this pastel yellow chair in the background. It was for my great-grandmother. Um, but we needed a coffee table. We needed some furniture. So I started making furniture for us, and then other people saw it. And then more and more people wanted furniture. And it just continued to perpetuate. And the busier we got with commissions, people started to give me a little bit of creative freedom to, to come up with some designs and come up with something that would work for their space. Um, so eventually I was like, you know, I'm sort of running a business here. I might as well just start a business. So naively as a 20-something, I just said, I'm going to start a business. And I announced it to everybody. I was really excited. And then shortly thereafter, I realized I have no business, ex business experience. <laughs> I don't know how to run a business. I don't know where to get a business license. I don't know how to, you know, read a profit and loss sheet, balance sheet, you know, all of these different things, basic things. Um, so I, was, I wasn't stuck, but I was like, you know, okay, I need to be really intentional here. So I went and asked questions. I read books, you know, did everything that I could to learn business, to learn about the trade. I often joke that in the first year of business, I was learning more about business than I was about woodworking and making furniture. Um, so after that, I just put my head down, really just kind of determined, okay, what do I want this to be? And at the time, it was my goal is to have somebody pay me to make them something. Well, that's a pretty broad goal and a pretty easy one to achieve. Um, and then I, I kind of focused on designing pieces. And so this is our first piece, um, first piece that literally I pulled out of my brain and put onto a paper and then made into a piece. This is our Evans coffee table. And to my surprise, it was actually a hit. People really, really liked it. 
Uh, immediately, you know, sent one to Manhattan, sent one to Miami, sent one to somewhere in Texas, I don't remember. Um, but it was really encouraging, and it was, um, it really allowed me to gain momentum. So we started working with um, interior designers to design different pieces for their spaces. Uh, this is another original, our Braxton coffee table, that again was another uh, big hit. You could tell, you know, with the, the glass of the previous piece and the wood and the glass and wood, you know, I just found a winning combination, I wasn't going to mess it up. Um, from there, um, as we continued to grow, we had uh, local uh, commercial clients like Motor Supply here that were willing to give us a chance. And when I renovated their patio, we made some, uh, some tables for their patio out of uh, salvaged black walnut from North Carolina. And it was really cool to just have people uh, believe in me and, and continue to want to support what we're doing. Um, and then as we continue to grow, I'm, I'm glossing over a little bit because I have a very limited amount of time. but. Um, as we uh, as we continue to grow, I was able to expand. Uh, I've got two guys working, uh, two additional guys working in the shop right now. In fact, literally right now, uh, they're over there working, working hard. Uh, but we expanded to a new shop space that quadrupled our footprint from what our original shop. Our original shop was like a thousand square feet, and now we're over four thousand. Um, but it really gave us gave me an opportunity to display some of these beautiful slabs of wood that we have, and to just set up everything a little bit more efficiently to be able to to come up with more of a production and. An efficient operation, and from there we really just hit a rhythm. You know, one of those like for the probably the four of you that have seen the Lego Movie, they're like everything is awesome. This was the this was exactly what was going on right here. Um, so we put out new designs. We're shipping across the country. Um, started shipping things shipping things to Canada. We sent something to Australia a few months ago. Um, started working more with commercial clients to create uh, these beautiful statement pieces, as I like to say. So this is a big solid walnut dining table, or dining table. That would be an incredible dining table. Uh, a solid walnut conference table for our law firm here in town. Um, if you've uh, been to Hotel Trundle, you might have seen this community table that we did for them. Um, and we also did, I think it was like 50 something beds, 56 beds for all their different spaces, or for all their different rooms. And then one morning I got a phone call that said, uh, one of my guys, he said, hey, so it's raining inside the shop. What do you mean it's raining inside the shop? We have a, a roof, you know, what's, what's going on? And he's like, just get here, you'll, you'll see. And so I, I went to the shop. Sure enough, it was raining inside. Apparently the, the building owner was replacing the roof and they didn't seal it properly. And so water was literally raining inside the building. That's the best way to expo explain it. We had literally cascades of water pouring into machines that cost thousands of dollars. We had pieces and slabs of wood that were floating. And at the end, you know, we, we ended up uh, having probably twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of damage, which, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't a big deal. It was a big deal, but nobody got hurt. Nothing was irreparably damaged. You know, it's just they're just things. They're able to be replaced. But for you know two, three weeks, I wasn't able to work, and it really, and it was depressing because you know, especially somebody who, who works with their hands, you want to work with your hands. Um, but to me, to some degree, although it may seem cliche, it was really a catalyst for change, or in, in literature they call it an inciting incident, where something happens and you have to do something about it. So for me, I was like, okay, enough of all these little frivolous things. I'm not going to make two cutting boards for Aunt Susie's party. I'm not going to make, you know, this rustic farmhouse coffee, ta or coffee table, whatever it is. These things that weren't our style, that weren't our niche. And so I really just focused, okay, what do I want Bricker and Beam to be? And what I want Bricker and Beam to be is handmade statement pieces. Like I said at the beginning, we're going to make Dining tables, coffee tables, desks, conference tables, and credenzas, and that's it. We may make some things here and there, but those, that's going to be our main focus. And so really just kind of lasering in on our niche, this is what we're doing, this is what I want to focus on. It was a chance, even though it was a really sucky situation, learning how to use that and maneuver, use that to maneuver towards where I wanted to go. Does that make sense? Um, so right out of the gate, we had to catch up on some orders, and I was just like, Listen, Flood, you will not beat me. Like, I will crush you. <laughs> and right out of the gate, we sent two of our, this, this is our drift coffee table. We sent two of these, one to Seattle, one to San Francisco, like in the first two weeks back, just really rocking and rolling. Um, and then, actually, sort of a cool opportunity. Um, some of you may be familiar with the company Etsy. Um, it's a, essentially an e-commerce platform that they allow you to sell things through it, mostly handmade and, and antique things. But... Etsy reached out to us. They sent us an email and said, hey, we stumbled across your Monroe credenza on our site. 
We're putting together a new furniture package for our headquarters in Brooklyn, and we want this to be a statement piece in our new office. And I was just like, yes, <laughs> of course, we would love, we would love to help. Um, so we, uh, we put together this custom Monroe for their, their executive office um, in Brooklyn, and we're able to send that out. It was just kind of cool but because we've sent, we've uh, sold a lot of things through Etsy, but it was kind of cool to have Etsy come to us for, for a change. So um, it was really encouraging just in that post-flood, post-funk you know, funk era um, to have people wanting to support us. So shortly thereafter, we launched our triad table, which has become one of our most popular dining table and conference table designs. Um, it's offered in a, a few different wood species. Uh, pictured here is a single slab of Clara walnut that was salvaged from Northern California. It's a mouthful to say. Um, and then from there, you know, working with <laughs> working with some commercial clients to really just make, like I said, you know, those pieces that people want to interact with. I always tell people that my one of the biggest compliments somebody could pay me on a piece of furniture isn't necessarily to say like, "Wow, this is great," you know, because everybody says, "Wow, this is great," but when people are just drawn to it, they just want to go touch it and feel it and figure out how does that work? How does that, you know, work? You know, they just want to see it and touch it for themselves. And so those are the types of things that we're focusing on and we're focusing on moving forward. What's not pictured, I wish I would have included it. This, I don't know, do I have a laser pointer? Oh, look at that. So in here, we actually recessed some LED lights. So when you turn off all the lights, you can flip it on and it's just like this nice little, this headboard nightlight. And, um, it also just happened to be that the LEDs that we put in there changed colors. So it was like green and red and purple and blue. They just stuck with yellow. They just stuck with the basic. Um, lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about a new endeavor that we're trying. Um, our sister brand is Bricker and Bark. And we just launched it, or we launched it about a year ago, and we had to table it for a long, long story. But we're revisiting it now. And this is my dog, Coltrane. And he is sitting on our Winston dog bed. And we're kind of we're gonna push it through the holidays, see how it goes. If nobody buys one, no problem. You know, it's not there's nothing that we're losing because we have all the tools and machinery and materials to do it. So we're gonna see if we can make some luxury furniture for the discerning pet, as I like to say. <laughs> I think that wraps it up, and uh, I appreciate your time.